I, I was undecided when I was asked to whether I should use PowerPoint or not. And originally I was not going to use it. But then I thought, why miss the opportunity to show you some of the stuff that's going on at the moment that I've been involved with directing as the, uh, as the advisor on nanotechnology to the government. So I thought I'd do that. Have you got the slides there? So the opening slide here shows the places I'm affiliated with, or some of them. Uh, the one in the middle is the Bedbrook Science Park, which you might drive past and you go to and from between Chipping Norton and Oxford. On the left is uh, part of the huge Warwick Manufacturing Group, where I'm now based for one day a week. And uh, that is a truly enormous, uh, uh, different place than Oxford. It's very heavily involved with automotive industry. And the reason that I was asked to go there for a day a week was to bring ideas from the sort of nanotechnology and spin-off land. This place is very heavily involved with Jaguar Land Rover, as you probably know, and is working very close to industry. The one on the right is my college uh, in Oxford, where I'm still based. But missing from this are UCL London in chemistry, which have kindly given me a part of a home, and Bristol physics. So when I was introduced as a physicist, I have to confess that at the moment, most of my life is spent doing engineering and chemistry. Next slide, please. So this is, this is the story of my life. I attended university by an apprenticeship. Being Cornish, um, the county was so poor back in the 50s and 60s, we couldn't send people to university automatically. So I hedged my bets and won a scholarship or an apprenticeship with what is now called BT. And it was a fantastic uh, stroke of luck because I ended up working in the Goonhilly Earth Station as part of my apprenticeship, steering the dish and following Telstar on the second or third orbit. So it was really exciting. I ended up at Southampton University, did two degrees, a PhD, uh, leading me on to teach physics at Imperial. And I thought that was really it for life at Imperial. Uh, but uh, Philips Electronics um, managed to make me an offer I couldn't refuse, and it wasn't monetary, it was resources. They gave me unlimited resources to do research, as it seemed at the time. Anyway, when they went through a retraction into core business, as these big companies do, I jumped ship, came to Oxford, and uh, wound up doing all sorts of interesting stuff, largely because the engineering department had forgotten to give me an office and a lab. So, so I ended up working with chemists and biochemists for the first two years, and that really changed my life. I founded two or three companies, and then I went off to found the, and build up a science park. Recently, I've been advisor on nanotechnology. I've just uh, founded another company. I'm helping two others form at this moment. And I'm doing this thing uh, at the, near the bottom. I'm a member of the Quantum Technology Advisory Board which uh, the government is about to announce a large amount of funding in. I would say I'm a nanotechnologist if I had to describe myself. And would I do it again? The answer is definitely yes. So calling myself a nanotechnologist, I felt I had to spend a little bit of time telling you what nanotechnology actually is. So this is the size of things. You can go from things like this is from an American source, obviously, because it's got a baseball at the bottom, a large thing, going through ants, hairs, uh, red blood cells, bacteria, viruses, and at the virus size, we're getting into the nano world. You might think that microbes are very small things. Microbes are another order of magnitude smaller, and from 100 nanometers downwards, or upwards on this diagram, we get into the, the world I by living these days. So we, we go from viruses, the strands of DNA, hemoglobin molecules, smaller molecules like glucose, and then down to atoms and water molecules. So I populate that region at the top, and I'm trying to design particles which will go into new materials, new batteries, or currently most of my effort is trying to design particles which will help us combat disease, seek out whether people have got very early stage cancer, and then try to do something about it. Next slide, please. So in energy, 
we're going to use these nanoparticles that we're designing now to transform batteries. At the moment, as you know, the battery, even in some of the advanced cars like the Nissan Leaf and the Toyota Prius and so on, they've got very limited capacity. We believe that by incorporating them as part of the lithium electrode and giving them an enormous surface area, we can store lots of lithium ions and then release them quite quickly uh, if you want to get a, a burst of acceleration. The, the key thing in this is to just get the energy storage capacity up. The first bullet point on here, rather than the picture, the first bullet point is something I'm working on at the moment is turning carbon dioxide back into fuel. Now those of you with some physics might say, this guy's mad, this is against the second law of thermodynamics. But if you use some of the spare energy that's around, like sunlight, uh, you could do this. And you're just capturing the sun's energy and using it in a different way than what we're currently doing, sticking cells on the roof. And believe it or not, we've done an experiment in the ballast water of a ship. It sounds very unlikely. It's a 10,000 ton ship. We bubbled carbon dioxide and nitrogen through the ballast water, originally to kill the bugs that were living in the ballast water. Because as of next year, ships will have to prove that they've destroyed all the organisms that live in the ballast water in the tank. And we had an unexpected finding. We found we were generating methane in the headspace. And what we were doing was we were cracking the CO2 and the water, combining it somehow to form methane. So some of the stuff on this, uh, this slide is not as far-fetched as possible, as, as you might think. Colleagues at Bedbrook Science Park have produced new solar cells with much better efficiency than currently and a, a fraction of the current prices. So when they build up that production in a few years, we'll see solar energy get lower. Next slide, please. I'll skip some of the information. This is showing some of the medical aspects. That little spiky picture there is uh, an idea which several colleagues have had to inject drugs in a very painless fashion by sticking something like a sticking plaster on the skin. And these little pointy things uh, are like little hypodermic needles, but they don't hurt because they're so small, they're even smaller than the singing nettle needle that injects acid into you and makes you sing. So these uh, would not hurt, they would just be like a, a plaster on the skin. We're also now delivering drugs by making them into nanoparticles so that you can inhale them. And it turns out that if you make the particles small enough, you can get straight through the blood-brain barrier very quickly and produce almost instant painkillers. But the thing that I'm really excited about in that aspect is we can tackle some of the neurological diseases in the brain directly if we design the nanoparticle small enough to get in through the nose straight into the brain. So some really exciting things here. Regenerative <coughs> medicine. Colleagues at UCL, are already beginning to make replacement body parts. Alex Cephalian there has made artificial trachea using nanocomposite materials. Uh, the picture at the bottom down here is of a, of a mouse which we found we could uh, design a particle for to inject into the blood and it would zero in on where the tumors were and show them up in an image very quickly. And of course, if you can show them up in the image quickly, this also says you can attack that tumor. So the picture at the top right is a, a porous nano sponge that one of my postdocs created. And she can hide in that nano spongy material something like Taxol, which is a traditional anti-cancer drug. You can then target the tumor directly, only release a small amount, and you don't get a lot of the nasty side effects that you get with some of the existing drugs. Um, this is about food. I'll go over this one very quickly. The top picture shows a schematic diagram of putting nanoplatelets into food wrapping. This is already out there, believe it or not. When you go to Sainsbury's or Tesco's and buy salad, it's already got 
these platelets built into the cellophane, cell and it prevents the ingress of gas or outgoing of water. It keeps the stuff fresh for several days. So this is something that's already there. We can design surfaces that are very hydrophobic, like we show here. Uh, there's an awful lot going on at the plant root, which we simply don't understand. So one of the things I've been trying to do is to get my engineering and materials colleagues to talk more with plant scientists and understand what goes on down in that root area and to see if we can get nutrients into plants quicker by delivering them via some nanoparticle. Next slide. This is something which is really going to transform some of the developing world. If we can find new ways of cleaning up water and in some parts of the world's, world's soil, we will really change society. India has already made a huge advance. This thing, which looks like an ordinary water filter, was developed by Tata. It's the Tata Swatch. And as some of you might know when you visit India, the, the water isn't always very drinkable. Um, I think I don't find that out uh, by experiment every time I go there. <laughs> if you take it through one of these filters, it really does get rid of all the nasties. And it's very, very cheap. The point is, that Tata and other Indian scientists have pioneered something called frugal innovation, which I'm now trying to transform and teach in the context here in the UK. You can also use these things like they have in Peru, fog curtains to generate uh, water from um, the, uh, the mist, in early morning mist. And the Namibian beetle at the top is something that's been doing it for millennia already. These, this thing down at the bottom, uh, not at the bottom, at the side here, is an idea of using solar energy to purify water by trickling it over um, a surface of titanium oxide. It's one of my favorite materials, is that. But it, it produces something called free radicals in sunlight. And that, that is the perfect knockout thing for any bugs. And then right at the bottom is the way to clean up polluted groundwater by pumping in nanoparticles in that uh, middle uh, well there, and destroying some of the horrible things which we used to pour into the ground, especially on old airfields and, and, uh, and the like. Uh, this is the Nobel Prize winners from Manchester, um, Gaiman and Novoselov. They showed that if you peeled away graphite, you could make individual layers, which we term graphene. These might have uh, completely new properties to transform our electronics and optoelectronics industry. And very quickly, some scientists in Korea and Singapore found they could transfer through this sort of continuous roll process this graphene material onto a surface and generate things like laptops and other displays. I won't go through the rest of that slide in the interest of time, but Bear in mind that nano anything, whether you have a particle, a thin sheet, or a rod, can generate completely new materials which we didn't have a decade ago. So. This is a, a glimpse into the future, and the thing that I'm involved with at the moment in an advisory capacity. We believe that there will be a revolution sometime <coughs> in the next 10 to 20 years on quantum computing, where we use the um, uncertainty aspects of quantum mechanics to perform calculations that you cannot do <coughs> with any conventional computer. And these are some of the sort of ideas that are around for processors that might work on this principle. And this is an area which the UK is very, very uh, well advanced with. Next slide. Um, I'm finishing up here now on something which is very local. Um, this is a mobile phone which has literally been dumped. And there is a company down uh, near Dickhoff which pioneered this. And it's a lovely example of serendipity. These people were working on warfare suits to make them so they wouldn't absorb any of the nasty gases and things thrown at a, someone in a, in a chemical warfare scenario. They realized that this would make things waterproof. These uh, scientists were allowed to go over the fence and set up a company
to make things waterproof. And within a few years, they were uh, waterproofing 80% of the world's hearing aids. Staggering achievement. They then went on to waterproof sports clothing, Nike sportswear and things like that. And their latest foray into this waterproofing is shown here. This is a, a mobile phone which has literally been dumped. And in their demonstration last April, they uh, gave a presentation with this phone immersed for an hour, and it was working all that time, quite stagnant. So this has all been achieved by putting control, very thin atomic layers onto the surface of that phone and actually onto the circuit board inside it. And I believe that it's, it's uh, advances like this, and some of the ones I've shown earlier here, which are going to transform nearly everything we do in everyday life. So that's what, that's what keeps me 